Hello, everyone. Welcome to Doc Talks. Uh, today, we have Dr. Parsoon Kasi with us, and he will be talking about neoadjuvant um, board bal in resectable mismatch proficient um, colorectal cancer. But um, before that, um, you know, I, I want to um, ask Dr. Kasi how he got involved in doing work on colorectal cancer. Um, I, I'm not going to introduce Dr. Kasi more because, you know, for people from Colentown, he's a familiar figure. And uh, the only thing I want to say is that, like, if you're interested in learning about what's happening in the CRC world, I would uh, recommend that you follow Dr. Kasi on Twitter. So welcome, Dr. Kasi. Uh, thank you again for the kind words, Manju. So um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how I started in oncology and uh, GI, specifically in colorectal cancer, uh, I think for me, um, the journey has been punctuated by the experiences during residency and fellowship and the mentors and the colleagues you uh, encounter that inspire you to, you know, seek a particular pathway. Uh, Mayo Clinic is home to uh, a lot of innovation when it comes to the world of GI oncology and colorectal cancer, some of the regimens that we talk about, some of the uh, figures who have shaped the whole field are folks that you get to walk the same hallway with. Um, and especially during the fellowship at, at, at Mayo Clinic that uh, allowed me to focus on GI uh, cancers and then uh, colorectal cancer specifically moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. I also want to say that your poster was one of the most trafficked ones at GI ASCO, so we are really excited to hear about your work. Yeah, no, I uh, when I went to put up the poster at 6.15, <laughs> before I could even put up the poster, there were people asking me about the poster, so... And then, uh, you know, from six to nine, and then there was a brief break for the bespoke, bespoke CTDNA oral presentation, and there were people still walking upstairs with me. And then when I came back at 10.30, we were still talking till like 2.30 till they forced us to get out of the area. So again, it's a good problem. I, I lost my voice uh, later that evening. <laughs> I can imagine. Okay. Thank you so much for doing this for us. No, thanks for having me. Yeah. So do you want me to discuss uh, some of the high level updates and the, about the trial and the background next? Yes. Yes, okay. please. So, uh, you know, uh, some of you might have seen some of the discussion, but I kind of wanted to uh, at a high level describe, uh, you know, all the relevant findings to date. Uh, I have some slides and I also then have the poster that we can dive into. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, background, you know, there's a, um, a lot of things going on in the world of uh, colorectal cancer in the last few years. Uh, two things uh, that are in particular of note that allowed us to develop this particular concept was, uh, number one, uh, there's been a new adjuvant paradigm shift. So the, the term new adjuvant means that treatment that you would do before somebody's surgery happens. You know, if people are familiar with the term adjuvant chemo, which is kind of like the adjuvant or mop-up chemo that you do to eliminate somebody's cancer. The idea of doing that treatment beforehand is something that uh, is already considered the standard for patients with rectal cancer, where you want to do your chemotherapy and or radiation if necessary. And the final plan for surgery is the last step. In fact, people have gone from new adjuvant to something called TNT, which stands for total new adjuvant therapy for rectal cancer. So that's how quickly that has changed for patients with uh, rectal cancer. In fact, all the trials moving forward are focusing on uh, TNT as a strategy, uh, not just new adjuvant. But uh, in general, for not just for uh, colorectal cancer, but for all cancers, uh, new adjuvant studies, there, there are many things that uh, why would one would want to do the systemic therapy part first. Uh, uh, a lot of our surgeons... Uh, uh, who like to operate, uh, they've actually been the proponent to help us understand that maybe them operating right away is not always the best strategy. Uh, there is suggestion that they might be perturbing the microenvironment of the cancer uh, by doing surgery first. There could be reasons to, you know, affecting your immune system in an adverse way where they're taking a lot of lymph nodes and things out at the time of surgery. Uh, you might be affecting drug delivery or the uh, immune response that your to, your body itself may be mounting. Uh, there's also suggestion that maybe uh, keeping the primary or the mothership where everything started 
uh, would be helpful uh, to that be part of the uh, treatment plan as, as you introduce, uh, especially something like immunotherapy. Uh, and uh, also just the whole stress of surgery itself, you know, uh, even though patients uh, are, are getting minimally invasive surgery or robotic surgery, especially for colon cancer and, and literally going home the next day, those are all things that are happening every day in our hospitals and other uh, hospitals that are centers for excellence for colorectal cancer. But also you have to realize the body is still uh, surviving that insult or injury, so to speak. So immune changes uh, in a negative way could also be in the post-operative phase. So uh, for all these reasons, you know, there is suggestion or idea that maybe doing some treatment beforehand uh, might help increase the chances of success. Um, and some of the parallels uh, have been happening in other tumor types. Melanoma or skin cancer is one of the tumor types where a lot of research has been focusing on the vaccines, the immunotherapy before and after surgery. And there have been striking differences of the exact same treatment done in a clinical trial, randomized fashion, where outcomes were significantly better if the same treatment was done before surgery as opposed to doing surgery first and thereafter. Uh, in the world of colorectal cancer, one trial that uh, a lot of uh, colleagues and patient advocates as well as caregivers are, are familiar about is the story of the MSI high or mismatch repair deficient colon and rectal cancer. And we've noted that in the metastatic setting, while a third of patients with uh, MSI high uh, cancers, even with uh, drugs like pembrolizumab and at the actual GI oncology conferences a couple of days ago at ASCO, they also presented data with Epinevo with updates. So there are striking differences, but there's still a proportion of patients who don't respond. And it's anywhere from a third uh, to at least, you know, 20%, if not more. We're still trying to figure out why that case is, but when Dr. Chalabi and the group moved the treatment with their niche one study to a new adjuvant setting, uh, nearly everybody responded. So uh, I guess there is definitely some pretense to why new adjuvant would be a good strategy. Uh, from a clinical trial standpoint and from a scientific standpoint, a new adjuvant trial also give you the, they call like a, them as the window of opportunity of meaning uh, that, you know, you could still do whatever you're trying to do, but get a quick readout uh, about as opposed to doing trials with hundreds of patients, I think with novel clinical trial designs and how things are evolving, this is something that uh, is being challenged that do we need trials with that take years to mature, that take hundreds of patients of uh, effort uh, to realize that something is not working uh, with novel precision medicine-based uh, focused design. And in this case, the precision medicine being the setting itself, uh, you can probably get away with smaller numbers especially if the difference is significant, you know, you don't need huge trials to tease out those minor differences depending on the therapy you're dealing with. Um, so that was one reason why we thought that new adjuvant would be a great fit. But the other parallel update that has happened in the last couple of years, while patients with the so-called cold tumors or mismatch repair proficient tumors or microsatellite stable tumors, all meaning the same, which is the fair majority, 95% uh, in the metastatic setting and anywhere from uh, 80 to 90 percent in the non-metastatic setting are the uh, MSS cancers that unfortunately don't respond to immunotherapy. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen this regimen called the BOT-BAL or botancilumab combined with balstilumab showing uh, the first hints of a promise of a novel uh, immunotherapy that uh, is working in patients with uh, the cold tumors. Uh, one interesting finding that shaped the change in the trial moving forward is they noticed that folks who had um, active liver metastases and the definition of active liver metastases was that um, they uh, it's not like you could never have had liver metastases. It's just that at the time when you enroll in the study, um, they had to be resected, ablated, removed or radiated at least six months ago. Uh, because the first 17 art patients that they treated, um, the ones who were benefiting the most were the ones who didn't have liver metastasis at the time. So moving forward, the phase two study and then the randomized phase two that has been completed third quarter of last year, just eagerly awaiting readout, uh, there was a huge proportion of patients who did not have liver metastasis at the time who benefited. So that's how uh, this regimen came to note in terms of patients with uh, colorectal cancer. So keeping these two big advances in mind with the new adjuvant paradigm shift and then 
for this uh, regimen, Bartbell, uh, we had proposed as an investigative initiated trial uh, to a genus, the company who makes this drug, about how about, you know, if we could consider the same combination, but in the new adjuvant setting. Uh, we also um, um, looked at, you know, designing this in terms of as a parallel to uh, the, the so-called uh, new study that was published in Nature Medicine. Um, also, the, there has been an update to that presentation um, uh, at ASCO uh, with over 29 patients treated with the uh, immunotherapy that uh, is approved for MSI high and melanoma, the so-called ipilimumab or nivolumab or ipinevo for short. So the idea uh, was to compare and contrast to how would this combination bought by Alfair, um in the setting uh, of uh, mismatched pair proficient and deficient tumors in the new adjuvant setting. Uh, we designed it to kind of keep safety in mind because the last thing you want to do is in a person who can get colon cancer surgery tomorrow or next week, curative intent is to jeopardize the surgery uh, because we cannot cure patients with colon cancer for the most part without surgery uh, and, and or chemotherapy for the ones who need it or who are high risk. So the main objective of our trial was safety. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure was any surgery that got delayed uh, would be considered uh, a negative and the study would have to be shut down if two or more patients uh, in the 12 patients that we wanted to treat would lead to a delay or cancellation of their surgery. So even a delay beyond 12 weeks was considered uh, as what we call in our scientific world, like a dose limiting toxicity or something that would want us to stop the trial prematurely. Uh, so that was the main goal. And of, of course, uh, we wanted to make sure that surgery happens safely as well. So any kind of serious adverse events or toxicity happening uh, in the perioperative period, even up to 90 days or 100 days after surgery, because immunotherapy is just like a vaccine that stays in your system. So could it even impact um, uh, somebody's clinical care beyond the first uh, uh, few months uh, was the main endpoint. And so we really fine combed any kind of side effects that uh, were attributed to treatment and or any side effects period that happened uh, during the build up to the surgery as well as uh, in the post operative period. So, uh, but at the same time, we of course wanted to see the efficacy question as well. And we on purpose uh, had MSI high cancer patients uh, as well because. Uh, if immunotherapy is already known to work there in the subset that have mismatch repair deficient tumors, uh, we should have uh, proof that it's working in those patients as well. Uh, but more so, the interest and focus was on the cold tumors, which is mismatch repair proficient tumors. And at the time when we were designing the study, um, uh, I would say anything more than a couple of patients responding would have been still promising uh, for further investigation because uh, pretty much the bar has been, you know, close to zero in the metastatic setting and some hint of signal in the early stage setting. So any kind of responses for us would have been uh, considered uh, promising. Uh, just to give you an idea of the dose, uh, you know, the actual doses that have been studied uh, uh, have been the, up to 150 milligrams of the so-called BOT, which is uh, a multi-immune activator. Uh, some folks uh, well, can argue that this is uh, the next generation or the second generation uh, CTLA-4 antibody. With the mechanisms that we were able to find in our trial, as well as some of the correlative work, it's not simplistically just another uh, epilimumab. It is different, uh, which is why even the toxicity that we are seeing is different, and also the efficacy that we are seeing is different. Uh, and also in parallels in other cold tumors like sarcoma and other tumor types, uh, the fact that this is working is, is is very promising. So we only chose half of the recommended dose or the lowest possible dose that we thought would be effective and also just one dose of it as opposed to ongoing immunotherapy, which is every six weeks uh, for up to four times in some of the studies. Uh, or so. So just to kind of give you an idea, this was the lowest possible dose uh, that one could have uh, uh, thought of or conceived to be given uh, in this study. Uh, so um, as shown here in this cartoon as well, um, you know, these are kind of like, you know, don't eat me signals or signals that prompt the immune cells to stay away from the cancer that some of these immune checkpoint blockade as the name checkpoint suggests uh, is uh, to kind of, uh, you know, break those interactions so that the immune cells are able to recognize, expand and activate and also 
uh, try to kill the cancer. But there are other mechanisms that are, it seems like there are some immune cells that are so-called the good immune cells from killing the cancer, but then there are some immune cells that can dampen the response or the so-called Tregs or bad immune cells. So it seems like it's not as simple as just activating your immune system, but kind of the diversity that's expanded uh, is, is of value to note. And then which of the cells are expanded more than the other, the ratio of it uh, in terms of circuitry is important to recognize. So jumping onto the results, uh, you know, when, uh, the, the, the so-called waterfall plot where um, things hanging down is, is is a good sign and every single line is a, a patient uh, and their response, uh, uh, which was actually the surgical response, meaning uh, how much of the cancer was alive or dead uh, when the pathologist uh, looked under the microscope. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea, I mean, this was also a learning experience for me as well. The pathologists do look under the microscope when they have a surgical sample, but they don't necessarily look at every single nook and corner of the specimen. They, of course, examine the lymph nodes uh, and they, of course, examine how much tumor is left. But in general, uh, not every uh, single section of a huge specimen uh, is is looked at. Uh, but in this particular trial, um, uh, our uh, uh, surgical pathologist Dr. Erica Song is the uh, you know kind of worked hand in hand as a co uh, PI on the study uh, and is also the senior author on our paper is is also important because without the pathologist and of course it goes without saying without the colorectal surgeons who see these patients this this trial would not have seen the light of day and she so these are in some ways conservative numbers because um, uh, even in some cases where there were just a couple of cells floating around in a dead mucin pool, like this person in MSI high on the farthest right who had a 98% response, pretty much the whole entire ginormous tumor was all dead, but just a small cluster of cells were present. So we uh, were, you know, um, from a, uh, we, we made sure that we reported all of this uh, so that we, in any way, we the last thing we want to do is overestimate something uh, and and lead to a wrong signal. So these are, in fact, conservative numbers. But you know, it's hard to fake uh, no cancer being present at all or the cancer disappearing. And and what was very fascinating as an experience and very uh, rewarding as an experience for us was you know the it was the subjectivity uh, and the adjectives that our pathology colleagues started describing at you know some of these tumor board meetings as we call them where every week uh, here at Cornell on every Thursday night we review every single patient's case every new patient gets discussed and that's true for all academic and community centers as well it's good practice to be making decisions as a team but then that's also a meeting where we look under the microscope together as to what did the pathologist find you know how aggressive was the tumor what did it look like? What was the mutation testing? And also in patients who got any chemotherapy or immunotherapy, what was the pattern response? Did they see immune cells around the cancer? How much of the cancer was alive or dead? But the way they were describing, you know, from the very first uh, patient that uh, got uh, this as a treatment was, you know, what did the patient get? Uh, you know, what did you give the patient? And we've never seen an immune response like this much or the exuberant nature of the response or the striking area of immune cells or tons of uh, you know inflammation and necrosis meaning uh, dying of the cancer cells so they, this you know there were things that even in the first two patients that were the so-called core tumors that had uh, you know uh, over 90% and 85% kill uh, the patients uh, here that are on the third and fourth that prompted us to write a whole publication that was in the oncogene journal and uh, we can share the links afterwards and it's available online free to read because it has some striking images that we had pre and post. Even just in the first two patients, we wanted to get the word out because uh, for things to work and also to work as quickly, remember these patients could have gotten surgery as early as three weeks from starting the treatment. So, so that's uh, very important to recognize that if you can have just three weeks of a treatment causing this much kill, of the cancer uh, that is, uh, you know, an unprecedented in many ways. In fact, a lot of patients as early as 21 days had surgery. So uh, we wanted to, you know, keep this trial pragmatic and practical, meaning that, uh, you know, right now in the United States, a patient, like I said, with colon cancer uh, is often seen by the surgeon first uh, and with the surgery team, as well as the patient and caregiver alike, 
the immediate plan is to get the tumor uh, out of your body as soon as possible. Now, again, uh, I would do the same if this was me or my family member, but at the same time, you know, it, it's important to realize that this didn't start this week or last week, this month or this year. Some of the polyp to adenoma to carcinoma sequence can take, you know, three to five years to develop. That's why if somebody has a colonoscopy that's clean, the next one is not due to like five years or so. So that's because we know that this is how things develop, but you know, we still have to remember there's the psychosocial piece. So the surgery happening as ASAP on the calendar, whenever the surgeon can get an operating date, which could be tomorrow, it could be next week. You know, so most patients, if not all of them, actually already came with a surgery date in hand uh, and were told that, you know, um, uh, I'm getting my surgery on February 4th. Uh, the surgeon said, asked me to do the pre-op testing and the COVID testing. And I'm also here to talk to you because I hear you have a trial. So to keep that in mind, you know, we wanted to keep it as pragmatic as possible so that all we were asking patients is, you know, you're getting your surgery on February 4th, it's a couple of weeks away from now. We have this immunotherapy that uh, is is not yet uh, proven or tested in the new adjuvant setting, but may have value, uh, especially for those with advanced cancers with, where chemo and surgery may or may not even cure all of them, is to consider this, uh, this, this trial. And so it, we were only pushing out surgery by a week or so at the most. So that was something that was acceptable to all the patients that the trial was offered. So it, it also shows the interest in the patient and caregivers as well who um, participated in the study uh, and the trust that they showed uh, to consider something which is not necessarily the norm. And um, um, uh, like I said, uh, as the trial progressed, uh, what was also very fascinating was, you know, patients and their caregivers, also the surgeons were themselves asking, you know, can we postpone the surgery by another couple of weeks because uh, maybe we can get uh, more more shrinkage and, 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 and kill of the cancer. So that's how uh, was, you might see, I'll show you in the poster as well, that uh, there were patients who had surgery a little later. It wasn't because of any side effects or anything. It, in, a, in a positive way, it was because uh, the signal was getting more profound as we waited uh, even a few days longer that uh, that prompted the surgeons and the uh, the teams taking care of the patient uh, on a week-by-week -week basis to maybe purposely allow for things to um, be delayed some. So as shown here in the dark green are the so-called MSS or whole tumors. You can see uh, from cancers entirely disappearing. Uh, you know, one, the, one of the first patients who was 100% is somebody who had uh, so much bulky tumor that even one of my colleagues who saw me the next day who where the patient was starting the trial was a little apprehensive about a person who was having some symptoms and bulky tumor to consider a trial that, you know, potentially may or may not work. So that patient's symptoms and pain and things improving and then the cancer being down to nothing, you know, it was, it was very rewarding. The second patient was 100% is somebody who were had actually had rectal cancer. So it's important that, you know, while this trial and each one looked at colon cancer uh, and a lot of the mismatch pair deficient studies from Dr. Sersek and Sloan and other teams have looked at uh, those tarlimab and rectal cancer where, of course, living with a permanent uh, ostomy and can be a life-altering experience from a quality of life perspective. So we did allow rectal cancers uh, to enroll as well, as long as there was a plan for surgery as next and no chemotherapy or radiation, uh, because of course, the ones who are candidates for chemotherapy and radiation, uh, maybe in the future in different trials, but for the context of this trial, you know, high rectal cancers or rectal cancer where there's a plan for surgery and no chemotherapy or radiation are pretty, pretty much like colon cancer, so they were allowed to enroll. So we had one mismatch pair deficient MSI high rectal cancer that had 100% response. Uh, the second um, uh, mismatch pair proficient MSS rectal cancer uh, had a very low rectal cancer where it would have been a, something called an ultra low LAR, so something that could have risked uh, an ostomy as well, that uh, the, the, the type of surgery that was done was uh, had changed and uh, ended up in a complete response as well. Um, the We had an 85% and also we had a 10% response. And well, also, uh, as we understood, you know, some of the micrometastatic disease and the pattern response, uh, you know, just to kind of give you an idea, as shown here in the cartoon on the right-hand side, we also noticed that what was striking was even if the cancer was present, uh, it was kind of at the luminal or the tip of the cancer. So if, if you can imagine this cancer breaching through the walls of the colon and the lymph node that it's involving, 
typically when we're killing the cancer with chemotherapy or radiation, even if it's eradicating, let's say, uh, you know, approximately 90% of the cancer here is dead, when it's dead and scattered in different parts and there could be cells floating around that are not bigger to be seen because we never really fail locally, you know, for the most part, things are getting so much better with um, surgery and radiation with sophisticated software and stuff. It's more so the question of systemic recurrence or the cells kind of, uh, you know, being present in the soil, just like grass with pollen or grass with weed or uh, in terms of things spreading elsewhere is where we're failing. But um, it, with immunotherapy, the responses that we see, we, we call it like inside out uh, uh, versus like root up or kind of like cirrhosis to mucosa, meaning uh, the, even if there was cancer, the immune cells like a wave were destroying them in a way where kind of like the trash was just at the door for pickup. So uh, it, even if there was leftover cancer, 75% alive, 90% uh, alive, as long as it was in the specimen that is already out of the patient's body in the trash can, uh, you know, honestly, from my standpoint, it's great to have more killed, but at the same time, as long as we didn't leave any cancer cells behind, that's more important because, you know, for MSS cold tumors, they'll get their surgery anyways. It's not like we're planning to avoid surgery here, but the fact that uh, you can eradicate uh, micrometastatic disease, that was uh, something, uh, you know, very fascinating and novel, which uh, was part of the, like I said, this paper is available online on Oncogene and also some cool, you know, immunofluorescent analyses looking at immune cells that we did with this company called RareSight, uh, which required very minimal tissue to be sent to them. But you can see pre and post shown here in this golden is the cancer itself. And around the golden cancer is the immune cells, different kinds, uh, CD4, CD8, good cells, bad cells, FOXP3. Uh, it's like a swarm of beans that you can see, you know, between pre and post, uh, just a few weeks apart, um, the swarm of bees around the cancer is is such uh, exuberant increase. Uh, and even within the same patient, parts of the body that had some cancer left behind versus parts of the body that had more cancer, you could see the activity of immune cells, like a busy office versus an office after 5 p.m. As you could see the differences between the type of immune cells, how active they were, uh, pre and post, so it was it was something that was uh, very striking. So while, but arbitrarily, you can argue that, you know, for major response, anything less than fifty percent is considered maybe not a success, and anything that's ten percent or less is considered quote unquote a failure. I, I would argue if even for the zero percent and ten percent, since we saw some inflammation, and if we eradicated the micrometastatic disease, and the person still had surgery and everything is removed with the goal being cure. Uh, then even these might be, uh, you know, not necessarily failures in my opinion. So I, I would say that every single case has been a valuable insight since even the patients who had 50%, 25%, when we check their cancer cells or DNA after surgery with a blood rod C, if there was any leftover cancer in any of these patients at more than 30 time points uh, over six months, uh, none of them had a rec recurrence. So the fact that we have such a strong black and white signal kind of speaks to the mechanism of action here and also our understanding, you know, a lot of these food measures of response were invented back in the day with the esophagus cancer getting chemotherapy radiation. So these numbers may need to be revised. In fact, a new study uh, published in lung cancer, for example, you know, questioned some of these arbitrary cutoffs, you know, who said 90% is the cutoff or 50% is good. You know, we kind of used to the real world where we come up with these arbitrary numbers of six months or three months or 50% is good or the glass half full or half empty. But they actually showed that, you know, it's a continuous measure that every 10% increase or as a continuous variable, the more shrinkage you were getting, that was equating to uh, the being cancer-free odds uh, years down the line. So this is kind of changing the understanding, so to speak, of uh, what we understand with, with uh, what's happening in these patients. And uh, so the study, by the way, is expanded based on these results. Um, uh, I wanted to kind of highlight some of the key conclusions first, and then I'll show some details regarding the poster as well. Um, so, you know, we found it to be a safe and active regimen. Again, going back to the safety that we didn't discuss uh, yet, uh, there was only one person, uh, and again, that's the same person who had the 100% response, 
who had uh, diarrhea that's from an inflammation of the colon called colitis that uh, can be managed uh, proactively with what we call steroid sparing drugs or as the name suggests, you don't need to use steroids to help uh, to hamper the immune system or dampen the immune system. Um, and if recognized early, uh, can allow the side effects to be nipped in the bud. Uh, that patient had the diarrhea on a Friday. It's always the Friday afternoon when you hear about these events. And he still was able to get surgery the following Thursday. So the surgery was not delayed. And in fact, that's the same person who also had uh, the 100% response. So if you talk to some of these immunologists and oncologists who've been treating and have had a lot of experience with immunotherapy over the years, of course, we don't want you to have severe side effects. Um, but even in the days of melanoma, back in the day, having some rash or having some diarrhea or having some thyroid inflammation, uh, it was one of those things that, you know, patients, caregivers and oncologists were looking for and they would be more worried if there was none of it. Because, you know, how do you know, there's no dial tone in terms of knowing if somebody's immune system is activated or not activated. Some of these side effects and symptoms, what they, what the, what, what they were going by, and, and not just this particular regimen, across the board, having any immune adverse events is very different than coming off of the trial, let's say if you had a serious adverse event for chemotherapy or target therapy, where as soon as you stop the treatment, pretty much the cancer is going to do what it was doing before. With immunotherapy is very different. You know, uh, I've had patients with vaccines or different kinds of immunotherapy that didn't even get more than one dose and had to be uh, taken off because of whatever adverse events. It's the tale of patients who are alive and uh, live years out where the word cure is being used that uh, is happening, uh, even in the patients who, you know, it's there's no specific number of doses, in my opinion, and no specific duration that you need to get immunotherapy. As long as it's working, it's a it's a gift that keeps giving. And because of the downstaging we saw and the responses we saw uh, in MSI high, uh, the goal that we're going to ask in the next set of uh, patients is, uh, and that was also something that we actually changed last minute again, because we also heard from our surgeons that, you know, in a good way that they were not inclined to operate on the next patient who was MSI high, who got immunotherapy, because they never find cancer and often everything responds so briskly, just like a marshmallow melting that sometimes it's actually it's harder for them to operate because there's a lot of scar tissue and so much robust infiltration from an immune standpoint. Uh, in fact, even at the discussion section at, at the ASCO, somebody asked about strictures developing uh, and we've had uh, some similar experiences as well with just even uh, pembrolizumab uh, used in uh, advanced uh, setting uh, where the surgery was only done because in a good way, there was so much response that actually there was uh, a narrowing that had developed uh, as an outcome of that. So maybe in those cases, we have less reliance on surgery and no surgery at all, or give that decision to the patient and caregivers and the surgeon. If they wanted to go for surgery and everything was dead, that will still be a success. If they didn't want to go for surgery and just uh, had no cancer worsening, that should still be considered a success. So we'll allow for that as a composite or as an option to give uh, and empower the patient, so to speak, and the caregiver to make that decision. And then uh, for the ones who are going for surgery, we'll look at uh, how much of it is dead as the key outcome variable. But uh, going back to the MSS or cold tumor story, if we were able to get this much shrinkage with just three to four weeks of therapy, the idea is, you know, what would happen if we let the immunotherapy brew longer? We have some... Um, uh, idea from the niche three study that was recently presented from Dr. Chalabi and colleagues where uh, there were deeper responses with uh, the immunotherapy NEVO with LAC3. And um, while some folks were discussing if LAC3 is the one that's causing the response, I, I think the big difference between that and niche one is also the fact that they used the monthly four-week dosing of NEVO. So the average time of surgery was uh, longer. So that just the fact that immunotherapy was allowed to simplistically brew for longer, in my opinion, that's what led to more responses. So we're going to formally investigate without changing the doses of the bot, just one dose still and keeping safety still in mind. We're going to allow for patients to have uh, double the duration of the same regimen uh, in MSS moving forward and compare and contrast the results with the results that we have here. Um, so, so with that, uh, you know, let me just uh, quickly just uh, show... Uh, a little bit uh, of the, the the poster as well, uh, which had some additional data uh, that um, is, is available online. But one of the things that we uh, found uh, as shown here in the poster is, uh, shown here in red are the patients who had CTDNA positivity, 
Heroku uh, through different platforms. Again, this was commercially available tests, robust, deep analyses in-house that we're doing with some of the scientists here, which had more insights. But um, none of the patients in the post-op setting that have been tested, some tested as, as much as four times on both plasma-only assays as well as tumor-informed assays have remained negative rate. And if you look at the mutations, you know, for the next 12 patients that might be seen in any cancer center, this is a mix of anybody and everybody. We had a patient who was HER2 positive, KRAS mutant, KRAS wild type, P3 mutant, uh, WINT mutations, uh, MSI high. We had uh, young folks who had germline uh, Lynch syndrome. We had older folks who had the somatic MSI high from as uh, young as 26 years of age to as old as 78. Uh, we only had four Caucasians in our trial, which is quite the opposite of the story of all the trials that are conducted in the United States, where sometimes in, even in hundreds of patients, uh, you, you barely find one African-American listed in the trial. So, And that's important for immunotherapy. That's not just about equity and diversity, but also uh, there is you know different types of HLA and immune uh, features that distinguish us apart. Um, uh, and again, not just uh, race, even uh, males, female, we had uh, six of each. Uh, one interesting thing, for example, we saw was um, out of there were five people, four out of five, uh, all young females who had this thing called early immune activation where they had fevers as high as like 102, 103, 101, uh, but no signs of infection and uh, the symptoms of the flu-like symptoms that go along with it, that again, with just some, you know, proactive Tylenol or Aleve or naproxen, um, and uh, if necessary, in some patients, just the low dose, 20 milligrams of prednisone, just for a couple of days to kind of nip it in the bud was something that uh, overcame that. Again, goes to show, you know, that there are biological differences in your immune system as well that uh, have to be kept in mind from um, uh, you know, male, female biology, as well as uh, different races. Uh, so we had, you know, Southeast Asians, we had African Americans, we had Hispanic Mexicans, we had uh, Middle Eastern, we also had Caucasians, so we had an equal mix of older, younger. So uh, in, in a good way, there's no signal to differentiate who's the one who had more response and who had the one who is this response, because we had folks uh, older, whichever race, uh, who also had the response and younger, uh, whatever age, because of course we are noting there's also the discrepant biology between young onset uh, colon versus older onset, and you know the plenary at uh, as for GI uh, for those of you who have attended or heard was in fact on the rise of um, cancers in young adults from Dr. Kim Yang that uh, was the plenary. Uh, so it's important to note that biology differences might be there between young and older onset. So the fact that we saw no differences so far to on all the crude analyses that we've done to date, nothing from a CPS or PDL one In fact, just a few hours ago, I got results from all the patients before and after PDL one And in every single mission, the PDL one went through the roof. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of these patients uh, had the so-called cold tumors with not much immune inflammation. So there's not much to tell or tease apart. We'll have more additional results from rare side to go over. And as you can see in this, in this, in this, um, line plot, you can see all kinds of immune cells, CD20, B cell, T cells that went up. But then if you look at the cells that are what we call immune proliferation versus uh, the ones that are that dampen the immune cells, uh, uh, they, they were the ratio of that was going down, which would explain some of the responses that we're seeing. Um, so um, I know there are a lot of questions. So I think I'll probably just stop there and I think we can maybe look at the questions uh, and then based on the questions we can uh re revisit things on the on the poster or or the or the talk okay sounds good thank you very much dr kasi um so sh shall we start from the top of the questions yeah yeah uh, yeah so the first question is um how do bot bal findings apply to unresectable cases and then um i've heard on colin town that liver meds disqualify one from receiving bot bal is this accurate yeah so so Firstly, on the latter question about the liver metastases, so in the, you know, there's something about liver being a site of metastases. It's not just that cancer is just like going there. There's something about the biology of the liver where the immune cells are supposed to be dampened. Uh, in a way, liver is the detoxification organ 
for all kinds of things that we, our body might get exposed to. So I, by nature, it's uh, supposed to be immune dampened so we don't go reacting to everything that we eat or drink or get exposed to. Uh, and our transplant colleagues who do all kinds of transplants in terms of liver, kidney, heart, other organs, they, they tell us the amount of immune suppression they need after you get somebody else's donated organ is less for liver. So it's there's a biological reason, not just a, a plumbing or a flow or an anatomical reason for the cancer to go in the liver. So it's not like there was no activity in the first set of patients. There were patients who had stable disease, meaning that cancer was not getting worse. And also there were some patients who had some shrinkage Again, arbitrarily, it wasn't beyond the 20% or 30% cutoffs, but it, uh, there was some shrinkage. It's just that, you know, uh, at the time, the strongest signal wasn't the ones who didn't have any active liver tests at the time. Uh, but uh, uh, there, there are, uh, but bot dial alone may not be enough. And formally, to study this question, uh, hopefully in the next uh, week or two, if not sooner, uh, one of the other trials that we are opening with the same bot dial uh, genus colleagues is. Uh, is patients who are undergoing a liver resection for liver metastases, they're going to get different variations of the bottom valve, bottom valve, part valve with some other drugs. So kind of like a platform where we can quickly try to understand this challenging question, you know, what is it uh, that about liver metastases that make a difference? So we're going to do that uh, as the next step, as a separate trial uh, that will be open at uh, Cornell. And beyond here, there are other uh, centers looking at the question of adding something else uh, as well to the bottom valve. Maybe we could you know, the ones who have active metastases, maybe we could do something to it, uh, like uh, radiation stuff, Dr. Parikh and her team, and other colleagues are looking into those questions. Uh, there are other drugs that are being developed as well. So, you know, there is a huge unmet need for liver metastases and what works there and what doesn't. Uh, but at least for the most part, what well alone may not be the sufficient strategy. And that's where novel trials looking at addition of other things to bottom bell or other modalities would be of value. Uh, and then the new adjuvant setting, I think the data speaks for itself, and which is why the expansion has already happened. So we'll, uh, you know, the question is, you know, if this is what it is doing, it might help increase the proportion of people who can be cured, not just the amount of cancer or shrinkage, because, you know, like I said, shrinkage is not the goal here, because our surgeons can operate in all these patients. Remember, all these patients could have gotten their surgery tomorrow or next week and were already booked for surgery. So shrinkage is not the goal here. I think the bigger goal here is cure. So uh, I think the next steps would be, uh, you know, to kind of see how many more people can be cured. Uh, yeah, and maybe this is something that needs a, a bigger platform, like a cooperative group or something else, or uh, some of the strategy to kind of make this a reality. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is, how do the results of the study apply to those who are interested in bot bal but have already been treated with chemo radiation surgery? Uh, it seems so, the response rate is lower for those pre-treated um, compared to those in the study. Yeah, again, going back to the idea, if the cancer is still in your body versus when it's removed, is you know there are still provocative uh, mechanisms as to why the response may or may not be as high. Again, um, remember in the third line setting, these were patients who already had, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, surgery or some still had metastatic cancer. The cancer was still in their body with a it all started in terms of the mothership uh, and we already had chemotherapy or radiation if they have rectal. Uh, so the randomized phase two is, phase two is complete. Uh, you know, we're eagerly waiting the results. It should be read out soon. Hopefully this, you know, depending on regulatory and some of these procedures that are beyond my understanding, I do see this becoming an option that would be available. Uh, hopefully FDA endorsed and guideline approved uh, where patients who don't have active rheumatases could get some sort of uh, strategy uh, through their own doctor. But until that happens, um, and that's something that could be shared uh, after the talk as well, there is a compassionate use program to your question. You know, patients who didn't qualify for this trial or don't have a trial when they needed treatment, you know, how do they get this immunotherapy? There is a compassionate use program with the company. Again, they still review and they still, it's just like opening a trial for one individual patient, but that is an option. And I know of patients who are already pursuing or getting treatment along those lines. So those, that would be that would be like the bridge till the approval happens. Um, it, it is cumbersome and it's not overnight the process, even though the compassionate use is available uh, with no cost to the patient or the caregivers uh, or the institution. But, uh, you know, post-COVID, there's been regulatory delays in opening things. So sometimes it's challenging to 
have uh, a trial for each individual patient. Uh, but uh, like I said, I think uh, the good thing is with our results and also um, the other results of the metastatic setting, uh, hopefully we can accelerate the approval that so that it benefits more patients uh, quickly. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. The next question is, um, can this be used in the post chemo, but MRD positive setting, but before confirmed meds? Yeah. In fact, that was one of the first things that uh, was discussed, you know, as, as some of you know, I focus on or have sent, you know, again, going back to patients to serendipitously stumbled upon CTDNA or MRD as a, as a tool, then, you know, it's something that we have been focusing on as a research strategy, but also it's something that I use in clinic in patients that uh, adds value to the care and is part of our decision making. And we have many trials in this space for that. Uh, I think the problem, uh, in fact, one of the first ideas or suggestions that was that maybe we should design a study that looks at that exact same question. Uh, from a statistical and scientific standpoint, that would have required larger numbers yeah. of patients and long term, longer term follow up and also there's also the element of false negativity. You know, somebody may or may not be cured, but they may not have uh, MRD positivity or CTDNA detectable in their bloodstream. So there are challenges uh, based on existing experience from the CTDNA trials that swayed us away at least for the short term from that as a strategy. But uh, yeah, that, you know, there is also reasons why to believe why that was a good strategy because that's the lowest amount of cancer that can be present in any person's body is that they're only detectable in the blood and everything else in the scans and uh, the body is already removed. So I think there are reasons to believe that why that would be a good strategy. Uh, and I think that would be like next steps that um, investigators uh, like us or other folks, depending on resources and grants and funding would uh, be very eager to look into. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, it's, it's it's a new setting that CTDNA has invented about kind of moving up the therapy before it even metastasizes. Okay, okay, thank you very much. In your talk, you mentioned that the the you know the primary tumor or the mothership, as you call it, um, the presence of it is uh, somehow you know seen to have a big role in how patients respond uh, to immunotherapy. So, do you think that would be a factor for you know patients who are CTDNA positive but don't have the primary tumor? anymore. Yeah, uh, again, drawing parallels from the melanoma world, uh, when they looked at some of their vaccine and immunotherapy studies, so it's not like um, uh, 100 or 0 percent that, you know, you don't respond at all if you do it in the adjuvant setting. Uh, and it's not like it's 100 percent if you do it in the new adjuvant setting. Um, so the response rates might be lower, but I would imagine just with the mechanism of action and the what we are seeing uh, and you know, in the third line setting on the same study from the same trial, the reason why we went along with this regimen was it was working in the metastatic setting. Uh, you know, again, the numbers are anywhere from 24 to 40%, depending on which numbers you look at uh, in terms of shrinkage. But there's a big tail of patients who are uh, alive, even though they're off of the bot well, so which which made us think of this as a regimen to look at new adjuvant. So, uh, of course, if somebody already had surgery or you know, already had this diagnosed years ago when this was not even available. You know, a lot of our patients uh, are living, you know, years because of all these options that have become available from, you know, pills to novel target therapies, immunotherapies, that uh, it's not like they shouldn't get a chance to get this drug uh, through compassionate use or when it's approved or through a trial if it's available. Or if there was a trial that was doing immunotherapy of this or some other kind that as a mechanism that's not just a simple PD-1, uh, I think there will be value to consider those trials. Uh, is this that we think that new adjuvant um, would be more conducive or pretty much almost uh, working in the fair majority and if not all patients? Okay, thank you very much. So I'll just skip through some of the questions. So one thing was like, you have seen um, the people with the zero response or less than 50% response and more than 50%. Um, do you have any idea, like, uh, are there any biomarkers to predict who will respond and who won't? Yeah. And again, uh, I, you know, like I said, I, I you know, what, like we, we are our understanding of the trial, literally, you know, we started in May and we finished it in August. So in, within a couple of months, the whole study was done. So it's kind of like a whirlwind of an experience, but we were doing a lot of these analyses in real time. So like, you know, I, I can tell you like the, the, what, the, one of the first patients where I had a 25% response, meaning that 75% of the tumor was still alive. 
uh, and there and uh, in a big tumor, you know, one of the first calls that I got from the surgeon and the team was like, hey, can you even start chemo right away or do it at two weeks instead of the four weeks? Because there was just so much panic about uh, look at that amount of cancer it was more than what they saw on the CT scan. And that's another thing. The CT scan underestimates the amount of cancer for MSS tumors and actually overestimates it for the MSI high tumor. So it's not entirely accurate by any means. Uh, so in that patient, you know, once we were starting to understand the mechanism, kind of like how the cancer was being eaten inside out, we, uh, you know, after informed discussion, because uh, we didn't mandate any chemotherapy, it was per the investigator and treating physician. We actually waited to start adjuvant chemotherapy till eight weeks because, you know, most of the files, as long as you start treatment, uh, you know, before eight to 12 weeks, that's still considered okay uh, to, you know, before we dampen the immune system with chemotherapy, oxaliplatin affecting the T cells, tons of steroids that you have to get with each chemotherapy. Those are all things that we th don't think would help immunotherapy, which probably still is working in your system. So, so to you know, my my crude uh, impression of uh, you know having gone through every single patient is that um, these are arbitrary cutoffs. Of course, we want to see deeper curves, uh, but more than anything, the only biomarker that's coming out is the timing of surgery. That I think if we had waited a few more weeks in the one who had ten percent. Uh, that that would have been um, um, uh, an eighty percent or hundred percent. So, uh, for what it's worth, every single person who is uh, you know uh, eighty five or ninety percent or fifty percent or above is somebody whose surgery was at least uh, four, five, six weeks later, as opposed to the ones who pretty much got surgery yeah. the moment they were told that you can get surgery. So, I think the that expansion in which we will treat 12 more patients, but with uh, the understanding that at least wait seven to eight weeks before you get an operation, that would shed some insights. And again, would hopefully uh, corroborate our hypothesis that the 10% or even the 0% in my mind is not a failure uh, if you understand what the mechanism is actually happening inside the body. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and then the other question was about, you know, between the right-sided and left-sided, are you seeing a difference? Like what about CMS uh, subtypes and the responses that you're seeing? Yeah, that's a crazy part. Like in a, in a, in a good way, uh, you know, whether it's male, female, young, older, we pretty much had, you know, uh, uh, tumors from cecum to ascending colon to, again, let's keep in mind, we were talking about 12 patients, but uh, you know, we because we didn't have any preconceived biases or 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 uh, filters, so to speak, or eligibility that would have uh, made it difficult for any patient to enroll. Uh, pretty much all our eligibility says is you can't have stage four cancer. Uh, otherwise, anybody who's going for surgery, uh, which could have been your transverse colon, could have been your descending colon, could have been your rectal sigmoid, rectal. Like I said, four of these were rectal tumors. We had a, you know, I would say a balanced uh, array of all tumor locations, um, uh, and we saw responses across the board. So at least for the preliminary analyses so far that we have in hand, and we are literally in real time getting week by week additional analyses from rare site uh, where we'll probably get more insights beyond CMS about what is there anything about the immune milieu of the, you know, 0 to 10 or 25% uh, responders versus later. Uh, but I don't think it's that simple. Like even in the same patient, when we looked at areas that had less tumor versus more tumor, even within the same person, there were differences between the immune uh, signature. So uh, I think we our understanding of what your immune uh, cells might be doing uh, in response to a multi- immune activator, so to speak, is 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 uh, soberingly limited. You know? Thank you very much. So I, I think one or two questions were about, um, they just want to confirm that these patients didn't get anything, no chemo before surgery. It was just this blood valve, right? Yeah. And for AI, this was, like I said, uh, to, for colon cancers as opposed to rectal cancer, the standard of care is that patients get their surgery and depending on the final pathology, uh, especially if they have stage three or high risk stage two, that they all get uh, anywhere from three to six months of mop up chemo. So that's the traditional standard of care. Uh, our idea was before you undergo any of that standard, which is your surgery followed by mop up chemo, why don't you try some immunotherapy for a few weeks? So none of these patients had pre-op 
uh, chemo or any other kind of therapy. Uh, and they all got a surgery within four to six weeks. And then subsequently, uh, you know, like I said, to keep the trial simple and also allow it to be something that could be, uh, you know, we had patients uh, from all the way from South Carolina who just flew in for the trial, got their couple of doses, got their surgery, went back home for whatever further follow-up. So we, on purpose, didn't mandate any chemotherapy or anything what to do afterwards because uh, all the magic, so to speak, was happening before the surgery anyways. And if somebody's tumor had responded, you know, we would have captured that on the surgical specimen. And then the blood draw, you know, for the MRD or CTDNA was just one follow-up uh, that we did. And subsequently, patients went back to their own oncologists, uh, you know, in Brooklyn, Queens, or any other uh, out-of-state patients that we had. So everything that they did afterwards uh, was was up to the patient and their treating oncologist. And one um, surprising uh, observation or was the fact that Patients were refusing chemotherapy afterwards, even though they should have gotten it, because in, in a good way, their tumors were downstaged to stage one or two, as opposed to morbid high risk stage three, uh, where a lot of times, you know, we also found ourselves conflicted about the fact that, you know, it's not like the patient is just refusing out of uh, hesitancy to do chemotherapy. Uh, they're also asking the right question. You know, you're also telling me that only 10% of my cancer was alive and everything was at the tip. And by the books, I'm now stage one versus stage three before then. And you don't do chemo for stage ones. And why should I be getting chemotherapy? So, you know, some of these patients have not gotten any chemotherapy, which is wild. Uh, and even for the 100% response patient that I just saw uh, that we waited, uh, you know, a few months before doing anything, you know, finally, just to be kind of kosher, we decided to just do three months of the Zil pill, uh, Ziloda, just so that, you know, we don't um, jeopardize, you know, chances of cure here because, uh, you know, these are patients who are undergoing curative intent operation and should be getting the chemotherapy that is known to at least add another proportion of people who are cured. But again, it was a very provocative finding that, you know, patients were refusing chemotherapy. And I think one good question in my mind would be, can a dose of immunotherapy, for example, decrease the proportion of people who may need adjuvant chemo, you know, just like the dynamic study, which half the number of people who got chemo based on CTDNA, I think, uh, you know, and maybe we'll see guidance from, you know, your group in Poland Town in terms of in patient and caregivers that I think it's a very, maybe it's not an attractive endpoint for the FDA and, you know, it's difficult for the oncologist has to realize what would be the cutoff, but you know, let's say if a third of the patients did not need chemotherapy based on the downstream that happened, I think that would be very important to stay away from, let's say, the permanent neuropathy of oxaliplatin or any, you know, chemotherapy side effects, even though Polfox or Kpox is manageable, it's still chemotherapy and still has side effects. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay, and uh, next question is, um, for those patients whose end stage was N1 or N2, after bot bal, were there any changes in the immune landscape of lymph nodes compared to those who achieved N0? Yeah, we, we you know, that's a great question. We saw a lot of CD20 cells going up as well. And um, I think there's, in the comments as well, it's also mentioned that, you know, it was a tumor upstage as well. I think the issue, as I said, is as opposed to rectal cancer, where you can pretty much be, you know, it's not 100%, yeah. but it's really good in terms of MRI, pre-op staging versus post-op staging. Of course, there is discrepancy, but... Colon cancer is a mess. Colon cancer yes. does not get MRIs. Colon cancer is di diagnosed on CT scan. And if the lumen is collapsed, you may not even be as able to assess how big the tumor is. And lymph nodes are always tricky to evaluate yes. on a CT scan. Um, uh, so overall, you know, the work from the European colleagues show that colon cancers are understaged when it comes to the MSS variety. And, um, overstage for the MSI because in the MSI, the lymph node may just be swollen because of your immune system activation. So they could be misinterpreted as stage three and then post-op, they may be stage two. Uh, mm -hmm. So overall, we saw pretty much clearance for the, for the, for the most part. I think the, anybody who waited at least a month to get their surgery, we saw like that inside out where the lymph nodes were negative. There was no lymphovascular invasion, no perineal invasion, and none of the tumors were, you know, beyond T1, T2. So th I think that um, the N1 and 2 patients, if they had waited a few weeks longer, uh, which we will test in the upcoming cohort, uh, we would have seen uh, the activity go down. Okay, okay. I think this is a comment from Natalia. She's an immunologist. So she says, 
Um, would love to see some data on the TCR repertoire of the infiltrating cells in responders yeah. versus non-responders. I think the issue with that is some of these require fresh, uh, connected uh, samples. Um, you know, I'm a clinician who sees patients every day as well. Um, I purposely kept the practicality and the patient convenience as my first priority versus, you know, analyses that uh, might be cool, but then might have uh, made the trial difficult to do. Any kind of fresh samples would have mandated that the surgery happen at the mothership here in Manhattan. Because we didn't mandate any fresh tissue collection or frozen samples, the surgery could have been done. Uh, that's the whole beauty of it. You know, there were patients who got operated in Brooklyn, Queens, on any day that was conducive for the patient or the surgeon. We had to do nothing except for archival samples later. And I think as you expand upon this in the future as well, um, you know, the you want something that would be applicable or easy to do for anybody, not just in the best of academic centers, but also out in the community and also the global world. So uh, on, on purpose, we kept the practicality as the first, which you know we had to be okay with accepting the fact that there will be some cool analyses that we may or may not be able to do because of the uh, sample, press samples not being collected. Having said that, of course, there are some new platforms and things, and there might be ways of getting around uh, analyses that may can be still be done on archive samples or or blood samples. So we'll we are investigating that right now, and we'll have uh, if we find anything, we'll of course uh, uh, you know uh, get it published uh, as soon okay. as possible. Okay, I think it, what she was saying, talking about, was that it be it would be nice to have a way of tracking down tumor specific T cells and to see if they will persist for a long time in the responders. Yeah, so I yeah. think that'd be cool to do. Yeah, it's uh, past the hour. And thank you so much. This was very, very helpful. And we're looking forward to more of these outstanding work from your group. No, I thank you for much for having us. And like I said, I think uh, the advocacy part and awareness part is is, is so important because, uh, you know, we had patients uh, from advocacy groups and organizations referred to us for the trial and uh, also allowed the trial to start and finish very quickly. Uh, because otherwise some of these things you know take years to mature and never see the light of day uh, all these things together as a team allow things to get into the clinic faster okay thank you very much a recording of this video will be put in colentown university um in within two weeks thanks again for um thanks to everyone for joining the call thank you dr kasi thank you bye bye